Welcome to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I'm your host, certified religious transition and trauma recovery coach, Terry Hales. I help people step out of the shadows of religious fear and shame and embrace their authentic selves with love and empathy. If you're ready to throw off the shackles of learned binary thinking and explore a more nuanced approach to life, this is your playground. Welcome back to the Emancipate Your Mind podcast. I'm Terry Hales, and I am here again with Kevin Hales. This is our third interview this month. We have one more left with him. Ugh, are we done yet? <laughs> <laughs> he is a licensed professional counselor, and he works with marriage and families primarily. And we're going to be talking about a topic that doesn't just have to do with relationships, but is a huge way that we can connect with one another. It is vital to being able to feel close and have trusting relationships with one another to be able to work through conflict, much like, you know, faith transition in relationships and some of the things we experience there. But I'm really excited. We are diving into empathy today. Mm -hmm. And this is a huge topic, probably one that's bigger than just one podcast, but we're going to cover some of the the things that make empathy so important. And we're going to talk about what it is, because so often when we say empathy, sometimes people have different ideas of what that means. And so we're going to get really clear on what empathy is, some of the things that get in the way of us experiencing empathy or practicing it, and then how we can start practicing empathy. So... Let's do it. Let's do it. So first of all, what is empathy? I'm going to hear what you have to say first. Well, maybe I'll modify that question and start with what is not empathy. Ooh, I like it. Do right? It. Because I think traditionally, at least I did growing up, and I think a lot of us probably did, we had a tendency to use empathy and, and sympathy interchangeably. Right? I would agree. That, you know, if I was being quote unquote sympathetic or empathetic. I mean, they, they probably meant more or less the same thing in our minds. There may have been a distinction between them back then, but I don't think we've really had a better understanding of the difference between those two in, until just probably these past, you know, 10 years. Yeah. Um, largely, at least for me, due to uh, Brene Brown's work, but, uh, I'm not going to give her all the credit. I'm sure there's been a lot of, you know, uh, people on the forefront of trying to understand, you know, empathy and and, and what exactly it is and, and how it is different. Yeah. Well, and I love even in the books, you know, in Daring Greatly, in uh, The Gifts of Imper Imperfection, where she talks a lot about empathy. Um, she's really good about referencing everybody that she's read that has helped her arrive at her conclusions. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, her work was informed by so many people. That's true of all of us, right? Mm -hmm. There is no one person who creates really anything, whether that's a mental health concept or, you know, an, an actual invention. None of us ever just solely create that out of our own existence, our yeah. own little vacuum. We're all going to be influenced by, you know, different people and people who have come before us. Absolutely true. So I love how we watched that documentary that one time where they took Star Wars and then they broke it down and showed right. scenes that were similar to other movies that had happened in the past decade. Right. And without knowing it possibly, or maybe he was conscious of it. Right. He was recreating scenes right. or <clears throat> concepts from movies that had happened in the past decade. Right. And that is how we got... Star Wars. The iconic movie Star Wars. Right. Yeah. And so I but love it, that. But it wasn't wholly original. No. So it was like his own spin on it. And so we're all influenced by one another and by by one another's work. So right. obviously Brene Brown was a big influencer in your work and in my work. Mm -hmm. I often hear threads of her genius, um, you know, come out of my mouth. Mm-hmm. 
and mm-hmm. and shape the way I see the world and and everything. And and actually, recently, I've been reading um, bits and pieces of the Empathy Effect by uh, Helen Reese. Hmm. She's a doctor, and she's talking about how empathy shows up in a physician's office or in the hospital. And then she's talking about um, she talks a lot about some of the things that get in the way of empathy. Yeah. And we'll talk about those a little later. But I I am loving her work and the way her doctor's brain is looking at empathy and um, and how it affects medicine. But then also the conclusions that she's drawn about how it affects society. So, right. Right. yeah. Yeah, I, uh, uh, I'm, I'm coming to realize that there are a lot of professions where empathy is a crucial, critical piece of of that profession. You know, I hear a lot about it, you know, in the medical profession, you know, we'll sometimes hear the term bedside manner, mm-hmm. you know, how somebody doesn't have very good bedside manner, and which is just basically, yeah, that means they're not very empathetic, right? Mm-hmm. They're not very compassionate towards you and your suffering and what you're going through and, 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 you know, maybe appear dismissive and brushing you off and and not real warm. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, I hear that with a lot of nurses. Um, I have a sister who uh, is in the profession of electrolysis, you know, which is basically, you know, taking a tiny little needle and removing the hair follicles out of your, your, you know, parts of your body. And, and because of the nature of her work, you know, where she's, you know, just slowly, arduously removing these hair follicles one by one, it, it creates kind of a, an atmosphere for deep, you know, conversation. And, and so she's really had to learn how to be empathetic and, and just hear people's stories. So it's, it's just interesting how, how some, some professions are more, uh, inclined in that direction and of course others aren't you know yeah but uh yeah so there's 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 definitely a need for it and i think just about every aspect of of our society i mean even in the areas and professions where there traditionally isn't a lot of empathy maybe maybe we need to make room for that Mm -hmm. i think that there's room anywhere that humans are working there needs to be empathy um i was just reading or listening to a simon sinek talk uh, to business leaders. Mm-hmm. And he said, a lot of times um, we're taught how to do specific parts of our job. So we're taught how to program the computer. We're taught how to perform the injection. We're taught how to change the tire. But what happens is eventually so we go from the, the entry level jobs into leadership, but no one sits down and teaches us how to lead people. Mm -hmm. And he said, empathy is a key component to leadership in business. And he said, so instead of getting leaders, we get managers. Mm -hmm. And he said, managers, they come over and they're like, I can do the job better. And they, they use a lot of shame and like, you're not doing this right. Let me show you how to do it better. And they step in and they, they disempower their employees because they don't like they can do it better. They've been doing it longer, but they haven't learned that their job now isn't to do the job, mm-hmm. but to manage the people that do the job. And he just blew my mind as I was listening to him say every single person, whether in business or not, wants to feel like they matter mm-hmm. as a human. Mm-hmm. And he said, you know, he was in this in this hotel, the Four Seasons in Nevada, and he had like the best barista ever, like the most. He was like, I paid him double. Like I paid him what the cup of coffee cost plus like that same amount for the tip because I was just having such a fun experience with him. And I asked him like, do you love working here? And he was like, oh yeah. And he was like, what makes you love working here? And he said, every single manager, every single person that's in leadership in this hotel will come by and say, how are you doing? Hmm. They notice him every single time and they ask, do you need anything to be able to be happier in your job or to be able to do your job better? And he was like, wow, that's amazing. And he said, you know, I also work at Caesar's Palace. Mm -hmm. And he said, there, I keep my head down. He said, because they're looking for the mistakes I'm making and the things that I'm doing wrong. He said, and I just keep my head low and just make my paycheck. And he said, that blew my mind because so often we think we just need to get the right people. Mm -hmm. And he said, actually, we need to learn how to be better leaders because that same person can be the kind of person that makes our customers experience super enjoyable or keeps their head down and just does the bare minimum to make their paycheck. Hmm. He was like, it's the same person. Right. Just different leadership. Right. 
So, right. well, and, and and I think you're hitting on a, an important point, which is, you know, so if, if we refer back to that 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 diagram of the cycle, right, that we we've referenced these past couple of podcasts, that heart underneath all of that is kind of you know the heart of the matter that's that that's what houses those vulnerable primary emotions and it also houses our needs uh those deep deep needs that we have as human beings and one can argue that that some of those you know need those common universal needs that that I think we all have is like you said to feel needed, to feel important, to feel mm-hmm. like I matter, to feel like I'm I'm loved and accepted. I really believe those to be very common in all of us. Um and and not just in our closest relationships, but you know, in all sorts of areas. And our professions and our jobs, I think, are a big part of that simply because we do spend so much time at mm-hmm. them. And so so being able to feel that, you know, in a professional capacity, I think would be a really uh, neat experience and and probably, unfortunately, kind of rare. So I think it's absolutely rare. I think it's getting more common. Mm -hmm. I think people are starting to wake up. They're starting to use that in their leadership training. Mm -hmm. We're starting to talk about it more. But I mean, we do, we spend anywhere from a third to half of our life at work. And if you feel undervalued or not seen or heard, I mean, it it does a lot towards your feelings of self-worth and your feelings of that you have some sort of power in Mm -hmm. your life Mm -hmm. and and something special to offer. And I think all of us want to feel like we have something special to offer because we do. Right. So let's go back to the beginning. We started off with what empathy is not, and we've kind of talked about it, but like, let's really define it. Yeah. Well, so I think you were going to put a link in your podcast, right, for Mm -hmm. the Brene Brown uh, video. Uh, this is a video I have personally seen hundreds of times because I often show it to my clients, and and I I, I think it's it, it's it's a great little short video that I think highlights and touches on some really important aspects of empathy. Definitely encourage anyone listening to this to to watch the video if you haven't already seen it before. But if you have, I mean, watch it again. It's it's like I said, it's short and and I think it's it touches on a lot of good points. She starts the video off by saying empathy drives connection. Sympathy drives disconnection because because the name of the video if anyone wants to just uh, look it up on YouTube it's it's called empathy versus sympathy or at least that's how most people uh, will search for it on on YouTube just put in Brene Brown empathy versus sympathy I've yeah. looked I've looked it up that way several times right but yeah so, so she starts off with that I I, I will say this uh, just in my personal experience, I don't think I totally agree with that statement. I definitely agree with empathy drives connection. I, I don't see sympathy as necessarily the negative opposite to empathy. The, the The opposite of empathy, I think, would be more along the lines of apathy. I agree. Uh, and that definitely drives disconnection. Sympathy, I think, is more of just kind of this middle ground of, you know, people who maybe don't know how to empathize or they don't know what to say or do in a situation. And there's clearly something about the situation that is, they feel bad about, they don't necessarily agree with it, but you know, it's, it's kind of a, you know, just kind of, Oh shoot, this sucks. That's too bad. And, and, and that's kind of where it stops. Yeah. I think sympathy can drive a wedge in between people because if you're coming to someone with like shame, for instance, something Mm -hmm. that's really vulnerable and you need empathy, you mm-hmm. need someone to really understand you and see you and love you through that experience. Mm-hmm. And you're met with, oh, you poor thing. Mm-hmm. Or in Texas, the worst is mm-hmm. bless your heart. Right. <laughs> oh, my gosh. That is the worst thing to hear because it does not mean nice things, you guys. Mm-hmm. Bless your heart is not a good thing you ever want to hear from a Southerner. And so like when you're met with this sort of pity yeah. almost, yeah. It, it actually increases the shame. And I think... It kind of destroys the the safety or the connection, at least for a little while. It can mm-hmm. definitely be repaired, mm-hmm. but for a little while, it sort of drives a wedge or or kind of creates this feeling of unsafety if I'm mm-hmm. going to bring you really vulnerable emotions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So it doesn't destroy the relationship per se, but now we're more up on the surface and we're less down in that heart space that you talk about in the cycle right. because we don't necessarily feel completely safe to be human with mm-hmm. someone who is sympathizing with us. Versus someone who is empathizing with us. Sure. So 
We've talked about what sympathy is, which is that feeling of being sorry for mm-hmm. someone. So what is mm-hmm. empathy? So I'm probably just going to kind of, you know, walk through part of what she highlights in the video. Um, because, okay. because so, so that's where she starts off. Empathy, you know, drives connection. Sympathy drives disconnection. Um, and then she talks about a couple of pointers that I, uh, I can't remember the nurse's name, but she talks about a, a nurse who, you know, has done research on this and, and she highlights four main aspects, you know, to, to empathy. And, and, and I think that those are, th- th- that's a good way to kind of break it down into maybe bite-sized pieces of mm-hmm. what empathy is and isn't. I personally have added a fifth additional uh, step into that whole process, which we'll talk about. But she, so she starts off and, and these two are really, they're not mutual exclusive. You can't take, they're really kind of intertwined. Mm-hmm. And the first two she says is perspective taking. And the second one is staying out of judgment. And so perspective taking and staying out of judgment, you can't really have one without the other. You, mm-hmm. th- that's why they go hand in hand. They're intertwined. Perspective taking is just the idea that what you are saying, what you are vocalizing what you are communicating right now is true. This is, you know, it goes back to that, that idea that perspective is reality, that what your perspective is, what you're expressing, even though it might be different from mine, even though I may not even agree with it, Mm -hmm. even though we may not be on the same page with that. Basically, I am accepting that your perspective is your reality. This is real. This is true for you. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, requires step number two, which is to stay out of judgment. Mm -hmm. Because you can't take someone's perspective and then judge the hell out of them yep. for it. You know, it's, it's you, again, they, they, they go hand in hand. Well, and what's coming to mind for me and what has happened in my own personal life and in several clients, like several clients have said this has been their experience, is someone will say the right things. They might say, I understand this is this is what it feels like to be you. They're doing that perspective taking. But when it comes to faith transition, so often we're like, okay, this is what it's like to be you. I don't agree. <laughs> this is like, we're so like, I think the church is true. I think our religion is true. I love being in the religion. I'm happy being Christian. I really like being Muslim. Like as soon as we say, man, that's your reality. And we're starting to get someplace. It's like we back up into our defenses. I need you to know right. I'm on a different page right. and I'm solid in my faith. So there's, I mean, there's something we need to explore there and maybe we will in a different podcast, but just know if you are listening to this and you're the person who's received those kind of comments, Mm -hmm. this is really what you're looking for is you're looking for someone to stay out of judgment with you and just sit with you and your perspective. And if you're somebody that is still in the faith and you're listening to this podcast in order to have better relationships with those who have left, avoid doing this because what this does is it shuts down the trust. You cannot empathize. And again, what we were talking about with sympathy, it becomes sympathy at that point. Mm -hmm. Whenever someone's like, oh yeah, I understand. Like if that was your experience, like that makes so much sense. I'm not there. That wasn't my experience. As soon as you say those words, it breaks that safety and that connection. That conversation will come to an abrupt close. You're not going to feel closer. You're going to feel more frustrated at the end of that, at that, at the end of that conversation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that also brings us back to, to where we started, you know, what empathy is not. Empathy is not agreement. Mm. And and that, I think that's where a lot of people sometimes get hung up on the topic of empathy, that that if I'm empathizing with you, I think we're afraid I'm, I'm sending the message that I agree with you. Mm-hmm. And, and, and that's definitely true from the religious person's perspective, that, that if I'm trying to be empathetic with you, I mean, number one, I would argue most religious people do not understand the concept of empathy because it really truly requires us to put ourselves in the position of someone else and to understand why they would behave and believe and say and do the things that they do. And that's really hard for religious people to do because they are so entrenched in their certainty of what is right and wrong that that becomes a really difficult hurdle to overcome in really truly empathizing with somebody else. Because I'm right, my religion is right, this is the one and only right way to do something to believe that it becomes almost impossible for them to truly put themselves in in your shoes and really truly understand why you're behaving and believing and saying what you're saying. 
Yeah. And I think you brought up something really important there, which was the binary thinking. Right. The more binary thinking there is in your religious faith, the harder it is to empathize. Because if you feel like you have the moral high ground, if you feel like you're right, and if you feel like if you agree or if you empathize that that person might never come back and go to hell, right. you're not going to be able to connect on a deep level. No. So if you're religious and you're listening to this, we've been there. I supported the mar- the Prop 8 marches, and I said and did things where I thought I had the moral high ground. Kevin talked about that in the last episode, his, his own experience with feeling like I was morally superior. We say and do things that are hurtful to relationships when we think that we're morally superior to the person that we're talking to, mm-hmm. and they feel it. If you're a person that has left the faith, think of a time when you used to feel like you were morally superior and it'll help you empathize with the person that you're talking to. I'm not saying it won't be less frustrating, but I am saying it'll help you at least understand a little better that maybe they're not intending to be total jerks about your departure because empathy has to happen two ways. Both ways. It, right. Both ways. Right. And and that's and that's where I think, you know, people who do leave their religion or belief system uh, can you know, struggle with that same problem of Mm -hmm. empathizing the other way, you know, partly because we're, we probably see some of ourselves in in other people and their behavior. And so it's hard to be reminded of, oh my gosh, I used to believe that. And I used to be in that same position. Mm -hmm. I I, I remember this conversation um, with our bishop, you know, which is a church leader in, in, uh, you know, the Mormon faith. And he came and talked to us one time, you know, as we were getting in, you know, about to kind of leave and not go anymore. And this was kind of his, I think, last ditch effort to kind of maybe answer any questions or help us uh, stay on the quote unquote straight and narrow path. But, you know, as as we were discussing, you know, I I basically made it very clear. I don't have any more questions. You know, I, I, I have answers now and, you know, you're really not going to be helpful on this front anymore. And, uh, you know, and we, we discussed just for a couple of minutes and he, he finally just kind of said, well, to kind of close up the conversation, because he said, well, I guess what this comes down to is you, you, you think that I'm wrong and I think that you're wrong. And, you know, I guess we'll just have to uh, agree to disagree. And it's, you know, it's, it's funny because I remember in the moment I was thinking, yeah, I, I guess that's true. But there's something about that that just didn't, see, you know, fit right with me. And, and since then I've, I've grown and I think matured a little bit more regarding that that whole concept and that idea and i and i think what i would say to most people now if presented that that statement i would say something along the lines of um no actually you think i'm wrong i know that i am right for me but i don't pretend to know what's right for you Mm, that's Um, a big distinction and, and, and whereas he believes he's right not just for himself but for everybody mm. and that this is the right way to do things and so so he would naturally see me as wrong i don't necessarily see him as wrong except for the fact that he thinks he knows what's right for everyone else i love that because it's not so much that you're looking at other people and being like you need to do it my way this is the right way this is the way to live a happy life you're like this is what makes me happy and i right. want to be i want people to see that as valid and at the very least, I want to know that that is valid right. um, without without people challenging me constantly on right. you know the validity of my choice versus this is what makes me happy and therefore it's what makes everybody happy. Right. That's right. such a good distinction. Well, and, and it ties right into this topic of empathy because we have to be able to say, hey, this is what's right and true for me. And that doesn't necessarily have to be the case for you. Mm. You know, I can allow you room to believe and feel however you want about something. The only time I'm going to have an issue with your beliefs is when they're hindering the the beliefs and freedoms of other people. And so if your belief system says gay people shouldn't be married, then we've got a problem. Mm -hmm. If your belief system says that black people were, they were less valiant in the previous earth life, like Mormons used to teach, then we've got a problem. Yeah. Uh, You know, anything that, that hinders the freedoms and abilities of other other people uh, I'm going to have issues with. Yeah. I think that's something that really is a point we need to bring up is 
it's not so much what people believe, it's when they try to impose their beliefs on others. I love the analogy that's like, because I'm on a diet, you can't have a cookie. Uh Like, that doesn't make any sense. Like, I might need to be on a diet for my health. I might need to be on a diet for a surgery that's coming up or something that's happening. That makes sense for me. It's the right choice for me. But that doesn't mean that you can't have a cookie when you're doing just fine and, you know, your metabolism can support you having as many cookies as you feel good about. But but what if I'm not doing fine? What if my metabolism isn't good? What if I'm overweight? You still get to choose if you want to have the cookie. Yes, but a lot of people wouldn't agree with that. That's true. If I'm, you know, if you're a friend or family member who I perceive as being unhealthy and and so forth. And I'm, you know, living this healthier lifestyle. Guess what? That's become my religion. Mm. And now I'm trying to push that on you. That's that's true. So it's, we're not necessarily wrong for wanting to help other people, but people also need to want to be helped. It, it, it comes down to the, the, the empathy thing again, and, and, and trying to have a conversation about these topics, not from a forceful talking at you perspective, but more from a compassionate, empathetic talking with you perspective. And, and and that's, and that going back to the empathy and sympathy topic, that's, that's, that's probably the biggest difference between those two is empathy is feeling with someone. Mm -hmm. Sympathy is feeling for someone. Well, and I'm thinking back to, I mean, I have friends who are still active LDS people. We have conversations about difficult topics and it doesn't feel I don't know. There's not a lot of friction in Mm -hmm. those conversations Mm -hmm. simply because they're like, help me understand. This is the way I have viewed this. But obviously you're viewing it differently. And I want to understand your perspective so that I can expand my worldview and look and see if what I think is still what I think at the end. And I'm like, okay. And so we'll have conversations about that. And so often we still end with them thinking what they think and what I think, you know, being what I think. However, we've met in the middle and I now really understand how they view something and they understand how I view something. And it brings us closer together, even though our beliefs stay completely the same as what they did when we started the conversation. But it it comes from, I want to understand you. Yeah. I want to know what it's like to be you. Mm -hmm. So you talked about the first two ingredients of empathy. Yeah. So, so there's that perspective taking and staying out of judgment Uh, And then the last two that she highlights in the video are recognizing emotion in other people. And then uh, the fourth and last one is being able to communicate that to the other person. Now, the fifth step that I would I would add goes in between steps three and four, uh, which is being able to recognize emotion in ourselves. Mm. And, And if we can't do that, we can't empathize. No, no, because maybe you recognize that that someone is really angry and pissed off about something and they're really intense and passionate about something. And depending on our relationship with anger and that intensity, we might find ourselves shying away from it, or Mm -hmm. we might find ourselves shaming the anger or pushing back or or Mm -hmm. just basically not being okay with that. And so we need to be able to recognize in ourself and our own experiences, you know, maybe when we've been really angry or, or passionate about something so that we can then uh, be able to empathize with that person's anger and kind of where they're at. But, the, but, the, but that's a, a tricky line to dance on because sometimes we have a tendency to make other people's experiences we we have a tendency to kind of hijack it and make it about us. Especially when we come from codependent relationships. Right. Because in codependent relationships, you know, you have the person that typically is the taker. Mm -hmm. They're the person that everybody else has to take care of. Mm -hmm. And they kind of move their lives around. And this happens a lot in religion. We're almost conditioned for codependent relationships, particularly if you're in a high demand religion where you're taught to have a codependent relationship with God or your church. So often we have codependent relationships also with our moms and dads or our spouses or our kids. What happens is if you're the person that's feeding that, if you're the giver, you feel responsible for someone else's emotions. I was just reading a story about these three little kids. Um, It was a social worker that was talking about this. And she talked about she was in a home where there were three children and there was a sign on the refrigerator that said, today mom is... And on one side, it said happy. And on the other side, it said sad. And the kids 
would come down and look at the refrigerator <laughs> to see how mom felt to decide how they should act. Wow. And so that is, that's kind of what you're talking about is some of us have been conditioned to react or to take other people's emotions on us and think it's our job to fix them. But our job is only to deal with our emotions and our experiences and come to terms with that. So, right. so, so it's, 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 it's a fine line to dance. It's, one way we can kind of self monitor you know to to determine am i am i trying to make this about me am i hijacking the conversation is to kind of check within you and when someone else is talking when they're sharing their experience am i actively feeling with them am i am i you know actively listening to what they're saying and kind of taking that in and absorbing it or am I maybe formulating a response mm. uh, about my own experience doing that and so forth? So it's it's kind of this – it's that, that extra step I'm throwing in is kind of an, an eternal processing that we're doing. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know, step three, I'm recognizing what you're feeling, what you're experiencing right now. And, and that's a step that's, that's difficult for a lot of us. If I've largely been kind of an emotionless person most of my life – I'm probably not good at recognizing emotion in you or myself. Mm -hmm. And so that's where I get hung up. Then we need to do some personal work there of better recognizing and identifying what I'm feeling and where I feel that in my body. And then, you know, once we're better recognizing that, so, so I don't know, maybe my step should come before the other one. Either way, that I think there's an extra step in there of being able to identify our, our own emotion. So, so maybe I need to see, recognize that in myself first in order to better understand how, what I'm seeing in you. But then we also need to kind of come back again to, you know, so if you're, you're talking about feeling really sad or lonely, then guess what? I need to reflect and go, gosh, what are times that I've felt sad and lonely in my own life? Mm-hmm. So that I can then kind of empathize with that emotion, because maybe maybe a, 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 an important thing to highlight right now is when we empathize with someone, we are empathizing with the emotion, yep, not, not the... so much the experience. Yes, right. I mean, isn't there a story of Brene Brown being part of a trauma recovery group or rape survivor or something like that? I, I thought I remember you sharing that, oh, man. and and she was she was in this circle of people. And she was being so like empathetic and compassionate to people's experiences. People thought she had gone through the same experience. Yeah. And she actually said, no, I, I've never, you know, we'll just say it was rape. You know, I've mm -hmm. never been raped. And they're like, well, geez, it, it seems like you, you totally understood what we were going through and experiencing here. You yeah. know, and, and it's because when we empathize, we're empathizing with the emotion, not so much the experience. And, and, and that I think some, sometimes can be a stumbling block for a lot of people who maybe feel like they can't empathize with somebody, mm -hmm. you know, because, well, geez, I've never experienced that. I've never gone through that. So how would I understand? Guess what? That, that statement right there can be empathetic, yeah. you know, even, even for us to just go, oh my gosh. I don't even know what that's like. I mean, I, I say that a lot to to the female clients that I work with, right? Somebody who's had an abortion, somebody who had a miscarriage, somebody who was raped, somebody who, you know, was traumatized by something. Man, I am like, wow, that sounds horrible. And I can't even imagine what that must have been like. It must have been so lonely. It must have been so painful. It must have been et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. I'm, I'm suggesting things that it must you know, might have felt like were I in their shoes and, and they're either going to let me know, yeah, that's exactly what I felt or no, it was more like this. And then I can kind of modify what I imagine that experience must be like. Yeah. And I love what you just did is even though, even though you haven't experienced some of those things that maybe some of your female clients have experienced, you know, maybe what it would be like, you know what it's like to experience loss. You know what it's like to experience betrayal. You know what it's like to make difficult decisions that people might judge you for. You know what it's like to feel alone. And that's what you're connecting with. It's interesting because the story of Brene Brown's that did come to mind, I, I can't remember the one about her being in the recovery group, but about her daughter Ellen mm. coming home and she wasn't chosen for the soccer team at mm. school. Yeah. You know, she was chosen. She was one of the others. Mm. So what would happen is they'd choose all the best players and they're like, and the others, we're going to divide you down the middle. And she was like, I was one of the others. Mm. And it felt bad to her because, you know, Ellen felt like I should be a, like, I'm a good soccer player. I want to be chosen first. Mm -hmm. And Brene said, oh, I bet that felt 
I I bet you felt alone. I I bet you felt unseen. I bet you felt underappreciated. It probably felt pretty cruddy. And she was like, you don't even know because she viewed her mom as this like big time speaker who was really successful. And Brene actually pulled out a poster for a speaking event. And this was like earlier in her career, pulled out a poster for a speaking event And she had been so excited to be selected to speak at this conference, and it showed all these movie stars by name and others. Mm. Brene Brown wasn't even mentioned by name. And she said, I know that feeling because I've been others before. Right. This is me. Like, that's who they're talking about when they say, and others. Right. And they sent me this poster. My picture isn't anywhere. My name isn't anywhere. I'm speaking here, but I'm the others. Yeah. I know what that feels like. And it was cute. Her daughter came and like threw her arms around her and she was like, it sucks to be the others. Mm -hmm. And they were able to like hug. And she felt like my mom gets me and understands me. Right. And it was, it was beautiful. Even though Brene had never maybe been in a situation with a soccer team, she knew what it felt like to be the others. Right. And yet that's also a tricky situation because technically Brene Brown didn't know mm-hmm. what it was like for her daughter to yep. be in that exact situation. So so we have to be careful with empathy because we often try to convince people that we know that what it's we like to be know them. what it's like. Mm-hmm. This is particularly apparent in a parent-child relationship. Mm. Because as parents, we think we know what it's like to be your age in this situation, on this sports team, in this grade, with these friends or whatever it is you're going mm-hmm. through. And folks, we do not know, okay? Mm-hmm. That, that That is one thing we have to get into our heads. We never, ever, 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 ever know 100% what it's like to be in the other person's shoes. And so, so we have to be really good careful on that, on that situation. Like if if I were in Brene Brown's situation with her daughter and she said, you don't know, I think my first response would be, you're absolutely right. I don't completely understand what this is like for you, but do you mind if I share something that I think is similar to what you're going through that I have experienced, Mm. right? Number one, you're asking permission. You're not forcing your perspective and your your knowledge, quote unquote, onto the other person. Mm-hmm. You're asking permission and you're, just, and you're acknowledging, yes, you're right. I don't know. I can't completely understand. And and that helps that person feel validated and, mm-hmm. and heard, not basically treated like an idiot. You yeah. Know? No, I, I'm your mother. I'm your father. You know, I, I was a teen once too, you know, and I know what it's like to, ex, you know, X, Y, Z. Mm-hmm. Guess what, folks? We don't. Okay. And so that's a critical piece to understand is that, mm-hmm. that if anyone ever throws that in your face, you don't know, just own it and say, yes, you're absolutely right. I don't, but I want to understand. Yeah. It's really important that I'm, I want to understand what this has been like, what it's, what you've gone through, and maybe I can relate to some of it. Mm-hmm. And I may not have told that story completely accurately because I was just remembering right, it. Right. But, but it just reminded me of a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of situations that we do find ourselves in. Yeah. We're trying to be empathetic. We're trying to be understanding. And somebody says, you don't know. And that can feel, you know, hurtful to me because I'm really trying to understand, but now I'm being accused of, I don't understand. Guess what? You're absolutely right. I don't, Mm -hmm. I can't a hundred percent understand. Right. And I, and I've had, you know, lots of people say that to me before, you know, cause I, I think I understand what they're going through and, and I try to communicate that, but they're, they're quick to correct me and, and I own it because it's, it's absolutely true. So it's just, it's just something to keep in mind, but going back to those, you know, those last couple of steps, you know, recognizing that emotion in in myself, in you, and then that last part uh, is always a challenge too. Of course, is communicating that to mm-hmm. the other person, and it's and it's often it's not we're not telling them, oh well, you're you're angry right now because guess what? Most people don't want to feel angry, and and you know, I, I remember that happening a lot in early in our marriage. You know, you would clearly notice that I was feeling angry, but because I thought anger was a sin, I was trying my damnedest not to feel angry, mm-hmm. and then you're like are you angry? You seem angry. And I'm like, no, I'm not angry, you know? (laughs) And, and then, then I would, you know, then I'm like, or sometimes I'll say, well, yeah, now I'm angry, you know, cause you're making me angry, you know? So it's, it just becomes this this back and forth who's feeling what and and so forth. So it always has to be done in a very gentle, compassionate way. Hey, it seems like you're angry. It seems like you're kind of sad or lonely, but guess what? 
let the other person tell you if that's correct or not. Yeah. You know, it seems like you're really hurt right now. No, it's not so much that I'm hurt. I'm just, I'm feeling really sad, you know, or I'm feeling lonely or, or whatever it is. Yeah. Right? Well, and I find too, that even adding like, is that right? Did I, mm -hmm. am I seeing that right? Mm -hmm. Will help. Because sometimes they may feel like we're still trying to assign a, an emotion to them right. just by saying it seems like you're angry to be like, I, it, it seems like you're angry. Am I, am I reading that right? right. Maybe I'm wrong. Right? Yeah. You know, it immediately provide an out for the possibility that maybe you're not right. Maybe you're not seeing this yeah. accurately. Yeah. And it also communicates like, I want to understand, like, help me understand what's going on for you. I see that something's wrong. It looks like anger to me, right. but maybe I'm wrong. Can you right. help me understand? Well, and, and, and let's just say, you know, like in our case, you know, you're like, it seems like you're angry. And I'm like, no, I'm not angry. <laughs> you know, guess what? Am I really angry? Probably. Probably. But guess what? You can't tell me that. No. Nope. I have to make that I have to, I have to take that ownership myself. Yeah. So even if somebody clearly is angry or sad or whatever, if it's, if it's clear and obvious to you, you still can't be the person to, to inject that into the other person's head. Yep. They ultimately have to come around to that. And so, so, so I, of course, experience that all the time in my room, you know, with, with clients. And I'm like, wow, it seems like you're really angry right now. No, I'm not angry. I'm just, I'm just frustrated. Oh, okay. So you're frustrated, you know, or you go with whatever they feel like they're feeling. Mm -hmm. And then guess what? Sometimes they kind of come to the realization of actually, you know what? I am kind of angry or I am kind of sad about this, you know? So it's, it's, it's an exploration mm -hmm. process. We can't be the one trying to force feed this into other people's lives and experiences. Yeah. And guys, this is especially difficult in faith transition because often you're going to be working with people who may not know their own emotions or who maybe don't want to be angry. They're so afraid of being angry or hurt or sad or disappointed or, you know, have irritation or frustration or any of those things that we feel that they may tell you they're fine. You may say, it feels like there's a wedge between us. I'd love to talk about it. And they may say, no, I'm fine. Like, I just... I'm off today. I feel a little sleepy or, um, you know, there's a lot going on in my life and I'm just stressed. I'm just stressed. There's, there's nothing going on between us. This lots of, lots of external excuses, basically, you know, we're, we're very good at looking for external reasons for why something is going on. And we're, we're much less likely to go internal and see, well, what am I feeling? What, what am I experiencing? Well, and especially if you are in a high demand religion that actually teaches you to numb certain emotions like yep. anger or fear or sadness mm -hmm. over time, the longer that you're in that high demand religion, the more you numb all of your feelings and you get to a point where you're not in touch with any of your feelings really. Yeah. And so when someone says, no, I'm not angry, I'm just stressed. We, we have to accept that, you know, that that's what they're, they're doing and say, okay, well, tell me about the stress. I want to be there for you. Help me understand what's going on. And again, it opens that door of, I care. I want to be connected to you. I am here to listen and understand you. And sometimes that can open the door to them finally expressing, I'm, I'm really sad. Mm -hmm. I just feel heartbroken and I'm grieving or I'm really angry. You guys, I know that it, it sometimes feels really scary to talk about those kinds of emotions. We're afraid that anger is going to destroy our relationship or we're afraid that sadness or disappointment is going to destroy our relationship. That's not what will destroy a relationship. It's ignoring the problem. The longer we ignore the problem and pretend it's not there, the bigger it gets, the more it multiplies, the bigger of a chasm it creates between the two of us. And if it does come out, the more explosive it is when it does come out because the pressure has been cooking for a while. So if we can just admit, I'm hurt, I'm angry, I'm scared. Well, it goes back to that concept that I think you probably already talked about in one of your earlier podcasts, which is this basic principle that emotions are not good or bad. They just are. Mm -hmm. All right. They're neutral messengers of information. They're not good or bad. And so I personally do not like describing our emotions through the binary lens of positive and negative, because what is synonymous with the words positive ne and negative, good and bad. Mm -hmm. And so what happens on a subconscious level is when I'm feeling a quote unquote negative emotion, if I'm feeling sad, if I'm feeling anger, if I'm feeling fear, if I'm feeling one of these quote unquote negative emotions, Subconsciously, I'm thinking I shouldn't be feeling this. 
this is bad. This feels bad. I don't like the way this feels. And so, so we're very quick to dismiss. We're very quick to bury. We're qu very quick to try and rush through that, distract ourselves, do something to get back to the quote unquote positive emotions, because it feels much better to be happy and to be in love and to experience joy and, and, and all of those things that are, that we would normally consider positive, but they're two sides of the same coin. Mm -hmm. We can't fully appreciate love and joy without the sadness and the loss. Mm -hmm. And so, so it's really important to emphasize that, that what we're feeling is not good or bad. And so we have to discard, we have to throw away the old, you know, teachings and, and principles that we were infused with growing up that that certain emotions are, are bad right it says throughout all the scriptures fear not we've probably heard from plenty of leaders about the evils of anger and 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 so forth what we have to do is separate the behavior from the emotion itself is it okay for me in my anger to beat someone or to kill someone or to break something probably not right i think we can all agree that we we don't think that's good but that's not anger's fault. I like to say that anger is often guilty by association. <laughs> right? I love that. Because because the emotion of anger is is a healthy emotion, it's an important emotion. It's it's a it's it's one of the most important ones we can experience, but how we act on that anger, how we carry that out, of course, we need to be more careful with that. Yeah. Well, and I have all kinds of ideas about that that I'll share right. on another podcast. Right. right now, my head is just, right. you know Spinning. me, my yeah. head's got all of these things. So, right. So lots of, lots of good topics that we're touching on, but going back to the video, right? Those four steps, perspective taking, staying out of judgment, recognizing emotion in other people, and then mix in there somewhere my additional step of recognizing emotion in yourself, and then finally communicating that to somebody else all bite-sized pieces of kind of the empathetic process. Brene Brown has said in some of her other videos that she believes empathy is something we can all learn. Yep. It's a tool set that puts into motion the inherent compassion that we feel for other people and ourselves. Yeah. And so she's a big believer that compassion is something that we are born with, that we, we just kind of have as human beings. And to put that into action, there is this skill set that we can all learn, which is empathy. That's definitely true for me personally, uh, especially, you know, becoming a therapist. Obviously, I had to quickly learn how to be empathetic because it wasn't something that I had really known about or been able to practice a lot in my life. So. Yeah. Well, and it's been true for me, too, learning the skills of empathy, learning how to really sit with somebody without being defensive, without making it about me, without just sitting with them and trying to understand them. You guys, that's something we don't get very often in society. I can't tell you how many clients have said, what just happened here was really special. I've never experienced this. And all I was doing was empathizing and active listening. Mm -hmm. That was it. I was asking curiosity questions, really listening and, you know, talking back to them, like repeating back to them what they said and saying, did I get this right? This, yeah. this is what this sounded like. And then empathizing. Is that how you felt? We don't get seen like that very often in our lives. And it is such a powerful experience when you feel seen and heard in that way. It's bringing up a Sarah Bareilles song mm. where she talked about, what does she talk about where it's addictive to be seen by somebody? Yeah. to I can't remember her exact words, but it's from the the musical, The the Waitress. And it's it's addictive when you know somebody loves you or accepts you or something along those lines. It wasn't even loves and accepts yeah. you. It was like when they see you and they, like, they understand yeah. you. It's addictive to yeah. feel important to someone. Right. And so this is what we're doing when we empathize with people. We're saying, you are important. I want to see you. I want to understand you. I value you so much. I will sit here with you until you feel seen and heard and understood. And again, I want to reiterate, empathy is a two-way street. Mm. So something that keeps coming up for me is Sometimes I will try to empathize with someone who is not, they don't feel safe enough with themselves to be vulnerable. And this happens so often with people who have a lot of self-worth issues or a lot of shame built up over time. And when I try to empathize and I say, it looks, you know, 
I bet it felt like this and this. Did I get that right? They're like, nope, nope. Again, we can't force people to em- like to allow us to empathize with them. So empathy in that way is a two-way street. We have to be willing to receive empathy. And if it's hard to receive this kind of love and attention and acceptance, it's a time to look inward and see what kind of self-worth work we need to do and maybe seek help with that so that we can heal some of the wounds that tell us that we're not enough, that we're not worthy of love and belonging. And that is actually my specialty. That's what I do. I help people with self-worth, particularly after faith transitions. So please talk with me. Send me an email or reach out to me in one of the ways that is in the show notes. Meet up with me on Instagram or something like that. This is what I do. So empathy is a two-way street in that way. But empathy is also a two-way street in that it can't just be one person always empathizing with the other. The other person also has to be interested in us or we will still fall fall distant from one another. We will still have this chasm that builds between us because one person can't always be the giver of empathy and the other person the receiver. It has to go both ways. It has to be something. And it's okay if we're just learning this. If you're the person that's learning and you're sitting there, maybe you're the first person that empathizes with the other person. But it's okay to communicate your expectation of, I want to hear you. I want to understand you. I want to make sure you feel seen and understood. And then after we've done that, I really would like you to do the same for me because I don't feel understood and I want to make sure you understand where I'm coming from. And so in order to have a healthy relationship, that empathy has to go both ways. Yep. Wholeheartedly agree. It's, it's a, like you said, it's a very vulnerable experience. And, and so if I'm on the receiving end, you know, cause I've had people, it's interesting cause it's, it's starting to move in that direction where it could be an argument, you know, they, they, they remind me of something I've said or done that was hurtful. And I try to own that. I try to go, Oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. I, that must've been really hard. That must've been really hurtful for you. And they're like, Oh no, no, it's, it's not a big deal. You know, I I'm over it now, you know, and then try to d- change the subject and move on. And that's a very clear sign that they are not willing or able to be vulnerable mm-hmm. and receive that empathy, yeah. uh, you know, it, it could, cause it could, the, the other direction it could have gone is, you know, they remind me of something I did that was hurtful. And then how would I respond? I get defensive and go, well, yeah, well you said and did this, you know, oh yeah, well you, you know, and then it starts to we get es- in our cycle. Yeah. You get in that cycle and it starts to escalate out of control. And, and so in some ways that one way street of empathy is, is a quick way to kind of maybe, uh, uh, avoid an argument or, or, or not get into a heated argument, but it's also, you're, you're, you're kind of leaving yourself out to dry, so to speak, because you're, you're trying to be empathetic. You're trying to, you know, meet that person and they're pretending like everything's fine. And, and, and no, I wasn't really hurt. And then you're like, well, then why did you even say that? You know, why, why did you even remind me of that? Let's just put it this way. In my years of working with people and your years of working with people, if someone's bringing up an old hurt from five years ago, 10 years ago. It's not resolved. It's not resolved. It's not healed. Yeah. Even though they're trying to convince themselves that it is, right? Yeah. It's the same thing with forgiveness. Oh, I forgive you. You know, I, I, I'm, I'm past this. But guess what? If you're bringing it up, if it's still hurting, then guess what? You haven't healed. You haven't forgiven. Yeah. Well, and it's fun because on my docket of things to talk about this year is cheap forgiveness. Oh, yeah. And I'm bringing you back on for that. Yeah, I, lo- I love that topic. So, so <clears throat> later this year, we're talking about cheap forgiveness. And we're talking about how so many of us are taught, especially in Christian religions, forgive and forget. We do cheap forgiveness. And we feel like we should be over it, like that we we said that we forgave you. We should have forgotten it. When we bring it up, immediately we feel shame, especially if someone empathizes with us and is like, oh my gosh, I bet you feel hurt or misunderstood. And then they realize, damn it, I brought it up and I, you know, I, I didn't forget it. And they're feeling shame. Yep. It is really difficult to be in empathy with someone who is in a shame cycle or a shame storm. Sometimes that is what interrupts the ability to empathize back and forth is someone is in shame. And just don't even go there with it. seems like you're in shame. That is a trigger word with someone who's in a shame storm. (laughs) Shame is like one of those words that will... We're ashamed to feel shame. Yeah, we are so ashamed to feel shame. It's so crazy. We have all these meta emotions. But yeah, be looking out for an episode on cheap forgiveness because it fuels a lot of these kinds of conversations where people bring up something... That happened five, 10 years ago. 
you try to empathize and they like quickly backpedal. No, no, no. I'm fine. I'm over it. You don't have to apologize. I'm not hurt. Right. But just know if they're bringing it up, it's not resolved. Right. Just real quick on that topic of people bringing things up from the past. We do not purposely hold grudges. No. Grudges is just another way of saying I'm still hurt and I have not healed from this. Uh, now, as to why somebody hasn't healed or been able to you know, move past it, maybe that's something on the, on a personal level that they need to kind of work through. Uh, but it could also be a lack of ownership and apology, you know, from the, the person who inflicted the harm. So just, yeah. just keep that in mind that we do not, we do not consciously think, Ooh, man, this really hurt. I'm going to tuck this away in the back of my pocket and I'm going to bring this up later and I'm going to throw it in your face and Ooh, it's going to feel so good. You know, it's like, no, that's not how we work, but it does often feel that way. Right. Yeah. Especially if it's something that's brought up again and again and again, it can often feel like people are purposely hanging on to things. Yeah. And it just means that they haven't resolved it. Right. Um, you guys haven't had the difficult conversations that we've been talking about for the last two weeks that allow you to really get down and resolve it. And so often we don't because we don't feel safe with one another mm -hmm. or we feel shame about feeling the way we do in the first place. Right. Or we're afraid of what those feelings are going to do to our relationship. And sometimes we hold on to grudges because you're so important to me mm -hmm. and I don't want to lose you. So I would rather be hurt and hang on to my hurt and like tuck it away and put it in the, the box. And occasionally it pops up. And I say really hurtful things and I drive you further away. But that's the thing that I'm actually afraid of is driving you further away, which is why I'm hanging on to it. So mm -hmm. it's this really interesting catch 22. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and, you know, I mean, on this topic of empathy, there's a lot of things we can talk about. There's a lot of things we can go into and, and cover. Maybe just in the interest of time, there's a phrase I often use, and I'm borrowing this from, from Brene Brown. Um, she says she does not believe that people are sucking on purpose. Right. And I love that concept. And I, I often get kind of a giggle and a laugh out of people. You know, when I say that, uh, are we sucking on purpose? You know, Bob, are you sucking on purpose right now? You know, did, <laughs> did you, did you wake up this morning and, and write into your schedule at 5 PM tonight when I get home, I'm, I want to have an argument with my wife. You know, it's like, of course not. Right. You know, how many of us are ever that intentional about being mean and cruel and, and neglectful? Probably few to none, right? And I'm not going to say ne never, ever, ever, because there's almost always exceptions to, to things. But generally speaking, I think it's really important to understand that we are not sucking on purpose as a people, mm -hmm. right? That when somebody is doing or saying something hurtful or neglectful, it's not because they thought to themselves, hmm, I think I really want to hurt my wife this evening. I really want to just push her buttons and get under her skin, you know, uh, gosh, you know, I mean, m m maybe there are people that do that. Maybe they're psychopaths, right? Maybe, maybe they're, they're people that, that need, you know, more intense, serious help. But generally speaking, I really, really believe that principle that we are not sucking on purpose. And if that is true, then what that requires us to do is to try to the best of our ability to try and assume the best. Mm -hmm. in other people and, and to think, wow, that was a really hurtful thing that you just said. Wow. That was a really, I can't believe you. That just happened. And our tendency is to, to, to assume the worst yep. in that moment, we jump to the worst case scenario and then our mind just kind of runs wild at that point. So it requires a lot of effort and intention on our part to slow down and to go, wow, that was really hurtful. I can't believe that was just said. I can't believe that was just done. Take some deep breaths, slow down, take a step back and go, what is going on? Where did that come from? Why would he or she say or do that right now? And, you know, if we've made some progress as a couple, maybe we can talk about that, right? Maybe we can bring that up and just kind of go, you know, instead of just getting defensive and firing back, just kind of go, whoa, what just happened right there? Mm -hmm. That was really hurtful. I can't believe you just said that. And and if we've made some progress and growth as a couple, maybe we can just talk about it right there in that moment. But maybe not. Maybe we need to take a t you know step back, cool off, don't let that cycle carry on too much, and then come back to that. But but I, I just wanted to really emphasize that that piece that you know I, I think a big part of that component of the empathy is trying to assume the best in people and 
accepting as much as we can that idea that people aren't sucking on purpose. Absolutely. And it's such a key ingredient to building trust. Anyway, thank you so much for being on the podcast again today. We have one more episode with him next week, and we'll be going over one last step to help you begin to build stronger, more trusting, more loving relationships and to work through some of the difficulties that come with faith transition. This is also exciting. We have, let's see, a week from now, a week from when this podcast will go live, we are going to be doing a couples workshop. So it is a relationship workshop. We're going to be working through basics of communication, conflict resolution, um, letting go of old hurts, and building trust and safety in your relationship so all of that can happen. The cost is $55. It is going to be an online Zoom call and it's going to be super therapeutic. So it is a a two-hour workshop and you'll be able to ask questions of Kevin and I. Get some of the basic beginning help that you need or just some more tools for your toolbox if you've already been in therapy and it's a great place to strengthen your relationship in this, you know, February month of love. So if that sounds interesting to you, we would love to have you there. Please sign up at the link before you forget, like go do it right now. So often if you're like me, I'll be like, yeah, I'm going to do that. And then I, it's out of sight, out of mind. So if that sounds interesting, go reserve your spot. Spots are limited and we would love to see you there on February 21st. It's going to be happening live at 5 p.m. Pacific and um, the link is in the comments and we're so excited. So thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Kevin. And we'll talk later. Sounds good. All right.